Hi, Paul Thompson here. Is it financially viable to make your own album in 2024? I have made an album and over the next few months, I'm going to take you through the whole process right from the initial ideas all the way through to the finished CD or maybe even vinyl and then eventually onto the streaming platforms. But I've set myself the task of making the budget that I set myself for the album back. And I'm gonna show you exactly how it goes. Some parts of this process I'm really familiar with and practiced at, and some parts of the process we're gonna be exploring together, but I'll share everything about the process with you and we'll dive into every single thing along the way. I'm also gonna do Q and A sessions. So as we get through the process, I'm gonna gather up all the questions from each week's video, and then we'll do a kind of Q and A session as well. Now I have a theory about recorded music. And if you think back to the first half of the 20th century, let's say from 1910, 11, when the phonogram was first invented, which had obviously a much better sound reproduction, although still terrible, through to the 40s, before you really got the uh, introduction of vinyl. Um, the record or the phonogram was a curio, an artifact, a kind of you know, something that you might get as a reminder of the real thing. And the real thing was that real concert performance that you went to, to see the band, the orchestra, whatever it was. And then the kind of tables turned slightly. So as you get into the better sounding recordings and more studio production and refined, so it wasn't just going from one take, suddenly maybe you've got multi-track recording coming in in the 60s and 70s. As you get into that era and the albums sounded better and better, you enter a kind of different paradigm where the album is the thing, that's the main thing. And then you're going to a concert to hear a slightly imperfect version of the album being performed. Then as we go into this kind of new era where the value of music, you know, has really been eroded, uh, People no longer kind of hold that value of going to the store and buying the record and taking it home and pouring over the over the liner credits and listening to the whole thing in one sitting. It's become something that we just stick on in the background, you know, pop something on in the car while you walk into the tube station, whatever it is. Music has become kind of uh, ephemeral in its recorded form. And now the real thing is, again, going back to the concert or sharing some kind of experience around the music. So the question is, in this environment, can how can you make a living? How can you produce music, spend money on musicians and maybe some studio time, maybe your mix, maybe your mastering, and actually be able to make that back, make a living and have some money left over to fund the beginnings of your next project? My theory is that the artifact is now the additional value that you add to your music. And it might be, it's a combination, I think, of a physical CD. This is the, this is the kind of hypothesis that I'm going to explore and that I'll take you along the journey with me. The idea is that you've got a physical CD and then maybe something that you add to it to add to that feeling um, of making something a little bit special. It's no longer quite enough to just have a CD, although maybe vinyl is, is the one thing where people really do collect vinyl. But how can you feel like you're connecting with the people who love your music and how they can connect with you? Well, you could add something to it. It could be a set of really beautifully produced postcards of you know, interesting photos of the artist in you know, uh, cool environments or from a live show or something like that. It could be a T-shirt. It could be, in my case, I make sounds. So while I wouldn't call what I'm adding to my album, my CD, a, a sample library by any means, it's a collection of the raw sounds that I made along the path of making the music for the album. It's a, like a sound pack, if you will. So I think all of these things um, will really add value to what you're doing and create something that is then worth something to the people who love your music and a way for them to support you and be able to fund your artistic progression. Now we're in this slightly odd age of kind of the, the erosion of the value of music and the idea of what, you know, how much is a CD, right? Because we don't have, buy CDs really anymore. We listen to music in streaming platforms, on Kobos, on Spotify, on, you know, Tidal whatever it is. Um, so we've lost that kind of idea of, of how much something should cost. But just to put this in perspective, 
If you imagine that you're going to buy Taylor Swift's latest CD, and I don't mean the one that she literally released at the Grammys <laughs> a couple of days ago, but the one that the previous one, um, in the first week of sales, that sold 1.6 million units at uh, 12.99, you know, 12 dollars 99. So that kind of economy of scale, we can't compete with that as small artists with very small followings. So is it still possible? Well. We have to get our heads around the idea that that the that it's going to cost more. If you're producing a short run of CDs and you want to pay the costs of the studio production and so on and so on and make a living and have a bit to put towards your next project, then we're, we have to be giving something a little bit different. Um, and it's a little bit special. It's a little bit boutique. You know, dare I say those uh, classic old words, artisan, like you uh, find in coffee shops and bakeries. Um, but let's not be ashamed of it. We're, we are artists creating something that we then want to share. So we have to find a way to make it work. So obviously you can't sell your CD for twelve ninety nine. You have to add the value to it. You have to add something in with it. It might even be that you put a package together which includes all kinds of things, a t-shirt, you know, whatever, and you charge more for it. That's the concept anyway. Now, what about this music? I started writing this album, although it was initially a project where I had a concept based around the journey through life and memory. And I wrote probably 20, 22 tracks, something like that. And at that stage, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just enjoying writing music. I was writing it for myself. And I think that that's the, the core of it. You have to create something for yourself and not try to second guess what you think might be popular or people might you know it only really is truly authentic I feel if it's something that you're doing for yourself so that was my initial thing I didn't really even think that I was ever going to release it I just thought in my downtime I was enjoying writing music and creating something and trying to trying to make it beautiful we'll go through um, in the next video when we talk about the first stage getting your ideas together we'll go through that in a lot more detail and that process and how I approach that but that's when I started and obviously I've been incredibly busy with my day job with Spitfire um, and so it kind of went on the back burner and then towards the end of last year I just thought I'm going to finish it and even if I get to the end of it and I've made something and I don't do anything with it, I just wanted to get that feeling that I'd completed that part, that project, um, which meant so much to me. So I went through that process. Then I got a bit braver and I decided to put a bit of budget around it. I decided to work with some musicians um, and go to some studios to record things, a little bit of remote recording as well. Again, all of this stuff I'm going to go into. And I got my act together and I finished it. Now, at this stage, as I speak to you now, <laughs> and you might find this difficult to believe, nobody has heard this apart from the musicians who played on it and Sicily, who mastered it at Air Mastering. Does this matter? I don't think it really matters because I, what I've created, I'm incredibly proud of. It reflects me, so it's got all of my kind of, you know, characteristics in the music. It reflects all my, you know, it's got everything from kind of uh, just a pure strings only piece with a with a beautiful violin solo over it, all the way through to kind of uh, crossover sort of mashups of, you know, really kind of modern production and classical sounding stuff and stuff that's a bit more ambient. And it's just, it's, it's almost, it's like a kind of, it's not really a concept album. It kind of is because it's about life journeys, but it's, it's a continuous thing. It's a story from beginning to end. It takes you on a journey. And I just, I'm just so proud of it and I think it's beautiful and I really enjoy listening to it. That's the first thing. Does it matter what anybody else thinks of it? I guess it doesn't really because I love it and that's the main thing. But I, do, I have got brave enough now to decide to share it with the world. So we'll see what happens from that. Now, I guess if I was going to try and summarise the style of music, I've always been really drawn to music that contains equal levels of kind of beauty um, and ecstasy so something that has every everything has that kind of moment where something ecstatic happens and I'm really drawn to 
music across the whole, you know, the whole panoply of everything from kind of, you know, choral music all the way through to, you know, uh, drum and bass or whatever. Um, I'm obviously <laughs> just showing my age by saying that maybe. Um, I love music that has that feeling of a kind of building to a kind of ecstatic moment. So you'll find stuff like that in there as well. Now, the, it might be a kind of question because, you know, people who watch my channel probably mostly think of me as being, you know, making sample libraries, writing TV music, whatever. Um, why? What do I know about this? What do I know about making a, a record? So just to kind of give you my credentials, the last record I made, admittedly a long time ago, uh, in kind of 2002, 2001, 2002, um, had a big budget. It was a quarter of a million dollars. Um, it was a priority artist on a label. Very exciting. Uh, fantastic singer-songwriter. Made a great record. Mixed by Brad Gilderman at Hook End. Mastered in New York. Sounded at Sterling. Sounded absolutely fabulous. Just as we were about to release it, the uh, record company management changed. All the artists were dropped, apart from blazing squad make of that what you will <laughs> and so the record just got buried it is now it is now weirdly it's appeared on uh, on streaming platforms which is which is kind of cool um but it was essentially buried and at that point i kind of i'd done quite a bit of production i'd done some ghosting as well and uh, you know been producing people who were supporting bigger artists but it kind of made me fall out of love with it a bit and i just really buried my head into drama and uh music for games and stuff like that. So that was my journey. So I do know how to make a record. It's a very different process in many ways to, to the majority of, uh, you know, TV, film, games work, in that you, you can, you know, if you're spending 18 months making a record, you don't tend to have that luxury of time on most projects. So the, the detail that you can go into and the refinement process is, is kind of on a... It's a kind of different ballpark. Now, I've had a, an element of that because I've just been doing this in my spare time over a longer period of time. But weirdly, this is my first studio album. Um, bearing in mind, I've been a professional composer since 1995, which is nearly, which is, yeah, nearly 30 years. Um, this is the first album that I've actually made with, of my own music, purely of my own concept that isn't connected to a game or a film or anything like that. And so it's kind of weird that it's taken me that long to uh, to do this, but um, but I've done it and I've got a modest target for it. So my target to break even is 418 copies. And so that's my kind of short term target. Hopefully I'll get to that. It's modest target, you know, but let's say we get to that. And then if I can get to a thousand copies, then that gets me effectively the budget for the next project. You then would probably want to sell a few more because then you're making your living if you're if this is your sole source of income. But I think probably for a lot of people who are starting out in the um, you know on the artist journey, you probably already have a variety of income sources. You know, maybe you teach, maybe uh, you do session work. Could be it could be a, a way of kind of just mixing it up but this is we're going to focus solely on this particular journey can you do it like this eventually you know um i'm going to put it on the streaming platform so that probably that will be you know the release date is in april so probably the streaming platforms will come i don't know a month or two months after that that's the idea and it might i might just kind of trickle it out that's the bit that i'm not so uh sure about the exact approach yet so that's something that i'm going to be exploring and you'll be able to see i'll be completely transparent with you i'll share you share with you all the kind of figures and stuff like that and we'll see uh what the best approach is what i think is is nice is that if you can offer an advanced experience so you know you have to kind of build up to something. You have to give it a bit of anticipation, create something that's a little bit special around it. Um, if you just chuck stuff up on streaming platforms day one, I don't know. I think maybe you're in some ways also kind of 
subconsciously saying, yeah, this is just uh, just kind of going to give it away for free and, and assigning no value to it. And I think that's, you know, I think that's a bit uh, that's a bit sad. So we'll see what happens. This is my theory. <laughs> we'll see what happens. In the next video, we're going to look at sketching out ideas. Then we're going to follow through with other things. I've planned out um, my developing your ideas section, recording yourself, preparing for sessions with other musicians, um, including remote records, but also, you know, going to studios, all the work that goes into that, working with contractors. Um, if you're working with an orchestrator, if that's part of the kind of style of music that you're making. All of those kind of ancillary things, prepping the Pro Tools sessions, stemming, all that kind of thing. Getting ready for the mix, um, prepping your sessions for the mix, whether you go to a mix or whether you mix yourself, and delivery as well. So all the different versions that you need to prep from the mix sessions. Then when you go to mastering, uh, working with a mastering engineer, creating what you need to get to CD manufacture or vinyl manufacture, and then, you know, up the different distribution chains, uploading stuff, all that kind of thing. So we're going to look at the whole thing. Um, and as I say, I'm going to go into uh, full detail on exactly how I'm doing everything, including setting up the little shop that you're going to use. I'm using Shopify, um, all the process around that. There are some things in there that are quite tricky to get right. Um, so there's a little bit of uh, useful information around that. So it's going to be a bit of an adventure and Starting today, I'm getting ready for the physical production. Uh, my release date that I've set is the 18th of April. And so it's kind of all building up to that now. As we go along, I'll introduce some uh, clips, a few bits and pieces of the tracks where it's relevant to talk about other stuff. Um, but I'm not going to put up... I did think long and hard about this, about, about putting up like a sort of 30 second clip of every track. There are 12 tracks on the record. And I just thought that's all we're really going to kind of give you the the feel, the idea of these kind of developing pieces that build. It's a bit of a, you know, it's a bit of a compromise way of showing it. So I'm going to show slightly longer sections, but where it's relevant to specific things like developing material and stuff like that. And that might be a bad idea as well. So I might reverse on that. And you might tell me we want to hear we want to hear like you know, a full track, or we want to hear some clips. I totally get that. And this is as much a journey for me and an exploration and an experiment as it will be, you know, when you do your first album. So <laughs> the last thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a few of the sounds in the sound pack. And I just want to reiterate, this is not a sample library. <laughs> sample libraries that that my incredibly talented colleagues at Spitfire make are deeply complex, multi-sampled instruments. This is when I've got, uh, when I'm trying to find the right bass drum sound or a ticky percussion sound and I can't find the right thing, so I make it. And some of these things have taken me a while to put together, like the balalaika took a bit of time to sample. Um, and some of them are super quick. It's just like chuck something up, tap the pen, tap, 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 chop it up. In it goes. Brilliant. That's great. Um, but it's a disparate collection of of sounds that are kind of cool. Um, they all obviously pass the test to get onto the record. So there's no there's no kind of rubbish in there. Um, but as I say, it's a it's like a, you know, 62 sounds, 600 megabytes or something that uh, were used to make the record amongst lots of other things, lots of Spitfire samples, some incredible musicians and, uh, you know, and and myself playing, tapping, bowing, various things as well. So let's have a quick look at some sounds. That balalaika. I'm just going to quickly flick through some breath sounds. <sighs> things that are useful with uh, with a bit of reverb and all that kind of stuff. Some drones. Oh, clarinets.
yeah, lots of ticky things. Uh, find those incredibly useful. A couple of bases. Dubby, dubby style. Uh, let's drag this one up. Defam stuff. You know, the usual kind of thing. Some stuff there. Um, uh, what was there? Oh yeah, again, slightly dubby thing. <laughs> Everyone loves a drop. Oh, uh, yeah, some guitar effects, feedback and stuff like that. Uh, things that were really useful percussively. There's a bunch of you know, guitar-y stuff. Uh, I love this. <laughs> that was made from a match, uh, striking a match. Um, oh, my kit. So I did want to, um, I couldn't find exactly the right drum sounds for some tracks. So I just recorded them myself, set the kit up mic'd it. Um, uh, so these are specifically bass drum and toms. Uh, these are the toms on their own up here, I think. Yeah, a few flams. Um, my bass drum, just the way I liked it, with the mic, a combo of inside and outside. Um, oh, this was fun. There's one track that is quite dubby, and I... I wanted uh, fresh dub breaks, so I made them myself. <laughs> Everywhere you go, more dub. Um, these are obviously the pure, you know, you got to <coughs> mangle them to make them sound good. Um, what else? Yeah, a load of stuff, nylon guitar, daddy daddy. Oh, sultry. Yeah, a few of these. Can't remember whether I used that in the end. I think I used this. Um, yeah, you use these everywhere. Yeah, those were great. So, little grab bag of fun stuff. Um, and that's the thing that you've got to think about when you think about your the, the value that you're going to add to whatever you create. This is, you know, this is a long way off from the actual beginning of the project. I mean, for me, you know, it was like a year and a half ago when I was actually writing this stuff, nearly, nearly two years ago. So none of this was in my head at that stage. It's only now that I'm trying to think, OK, can, it, can you do this? Can, is this a possibility? Or do we basically just say, you know, you have to find some other way of financing making a record because it's only going to end up on streaming and you're not going to earn very much money from it. Um, but let's say that this is possible. You need to think about the people who um, are interested in your work. And for me, you know, it's it's people who are probably doing stuff with, with uh, you know, DAWs, making their own music um, in whatever form. And maybe this is this is an interesting little freebie extra that I can add on to kind of help, you know, the idea of, OK, it's a CD, but it's not it's not a CD that's twelve ninety nine like we might expect in the shop because I'm not pressing up a hundred thousand of them. So, um, you know, you might find that that, like I say, your audience is going to be interested in a poster or it might be a T-shirt and you might add on the cost of that. There's going to be something that is going to make it, you've got to think about it like kind of, you know, merch and see um, what feels right. So if you've watched this far, thank you very much. Um, I think I'm, it's a mixture of emotions. I've got to say, I'm, uh, I'm excited to see what people think of the record when it's released and it's not released yet. So I've got a little bit of time to go for that, but also I feel like I've made something that I'm really proud of and had some incredibly talented musicians play on some of my tracks of stuff. And I said this to the um, to the string players, went to Rack and recorded with Isabel Gracefield um, and, and Hillary's incredible musicians. And um, before the session, I said, this is kind of weird for me because this is the first time that I'm actually putting music on the stands 
that I haven't written for somebody else. Um, it's a strange sensation, and uh, but strangely addictive as well. And I want to kind of do it more. So I'm I'm excited. I'm nervous, you know. Um, but you know, I guess you just got to keep doing stuff. You just got to push yourself out your comfort zone and see what happens. So um, here we go. The one thing that I can guarantee you is that over the next couple of months, I will, I'm absolutely going to spill my guts about the whole, the whole thing. One of the tracks, which, which is what we're going to be looking at in the next video, um, began when I was sat in the school car park and an idea came into my head. And so I got my phone out, voice recorded it. Uh, and then when I got back to the studio, I had to try and remember the chords that went around it. But that turned into the thing that opens the album. You know, it's not a hugely long track, but um, but it turned into a really lovely, you know, piece of music. So all of that process I'm going to dig into. And uh, like I say, we'll do Q&As as well along the way. So thank you for watching. And I hope you're going to enjoy coming along this little adventure with me over the next couple of months. And there'll be something at the end of it. There'll be a record. It'll be there. A real thing. Well, it's actually there already because it's mastered. Um, but at the moment, it only exists kind of, you know, in uh, on my hard drive. <laughs> so exciting. See you on the next one. Bye bye.